When people first hear that you're from a family business, they will always think that you know you have it in life, you made it. But you know, there's so much struggles that you don't see behind the scenes. For the last 12 years that I've been in the business, I've been tapping and leveraging on our partners, on people, working with them, collaborating with them to help me. But at the same time, also help them. If you use our crunch cutlery along with your regular meals, it supercharges your meal with eight different sources of fiber. Well, oh, that's something I'm lacking now in my diet, actually. <laughs> the business is always changing. It's about surviving, pivoting, and looking for opportunities where it could be the next business. John Cheng runs his family's 74-year-old sugar business. Since taking the reins, John has decided to make the entire food industry more sustainable. Take an example. Before COVID, we were all trying to go towards like flexible work arrangements. But it was only when COVID hit, then everyone started working from home. Why can't that be the same for food sustainability? There's not enough people trying to do it. Does the world really need to go hungry before we actually do something about it? My love affair for cycling started many years ago, but it took a pause when I started getting busy with work. Uh, I was constantly flying around until COVID-19 hit and I rediscovered my passion for cycling. I cycle almost every week. It's helped me to think more clearly as well at the same time, clear my thoughts. So I get a lot of inspiration when I cycle. I hope to achieve more than 100 km cycling across the whole of Singapore. Hopefully I can do it by this year. Likewise, with my own business, I want to push through all the hurdles as well as the limits that I think are set and go beyond that. I graduated from the Singapore Management University in 2007 and then I decided to work in a bank because I, at that time, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I worked for a year and then my father's health started to decline. That was when I thought I better go back into the family business so that I could help him. I joined the business in 2008. I didn't know anything. So with limited experience then coming into a sugar business, everything was totally new to me. I was the youngest, in fact. So when we wanted to standardize our processes back then, my brother said, uh, you, I don't think you can, can do it. Uh, and, and he laughed because that was something to change the mindsets of the older workers was going to be very difficult. And sometimes, you know, they will even tell you that, hey, what do you know, young man? They'll say, you know what, I eat more sugar than you eat rice. Ah. And to me, I took it as a challenge. I went down to the production every day, uh, trying to get them to change certain things that they were doing. I kept trying to persuade them and convince them. Uh, it took a lot of hard work to do that. Hey, uncle, you're you Yeah, you're here for a long time. I've been 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 here for a long time. Okay, okay. 
Cheng Yuheng Candy Factory started out as a candy manufacturer in 1947. It was actually started by my grandfather. Then my father came in the business and because there was a lot of competition from China, so we decided to actually move into making rock sugar, red jaggery sugar and black jaggery sugar, where we use in our putu mayam uh, string hoppers. And uh, that, that's basically from us. Uh, and you can't find it anywhere else in the world. Even our neighbours in Malaysia, they use the brown sugar, not the, the orange sugar. More than 70 years ago, we were located in Upper Serangoon Road in a shop house where my family used to stay. We were actually forced to move due to urbanisation. The family home and candy factory were demolished more than 30 years ago. John and his elder brother Liang Keng, the company's managing director, have come back to the very spot where the business started. Then we walk about one, two hundred meters will mm. be our Cheng Yuheng Candy Factory. Right. Just right here. Oh, Texas this... Chicken. <laughs> so this was the... The factory, factory itself. Here. Then walking forward, the shop the house, shop house right? which is uh, hmm. just just over there. I also remember when you go, want to go to the factory, you have to go by the back door, right? Yeah. There was a goose pen. Yeah, maybe there's a goose pen. Huh? Maybe <laughs> there are a few goose and ducks. Huh, no? I used to so they'll attack you, right? No, I would like disturb them because they make a lot of noise when you walk past. Ah, right? Right, okay. So sustainability has always been the DNA of our business, uh, even from my grandfather's time. Uh, even though they didn't call it sustainability back then, and it was more of like trying to save money and trying to maximize uh, profit. Maximizing profits meant being frugal with materials and turning waste into new products a principle that's now come to be called circularity. The process of making rock sugar is quite simple. We first melt sugar and, and we add it with water and then we move in priorities. After that, we transfer the liquid sugar into many pills and we leave it to crystallize for 14 days. During this time, we cannot shake or move these pills as it will affect the crystallization process. After these 14 days of crystallization, we actually remove the liquid sugar, which goes into our sugar process again. It will be reused a few times before it is used in the red and black jaggery sugar process. After we remove the liquid sugar that is used in our other processes, what remains is the rock sugar along the pill. And our workers would actually take these pills and slam it on a table where the crystals will actually come out and then further crush it. And then after that, they will actually send it into the oven to dry it uh, compared to the past where they used to sun it in the outdoors. After that, uh, they will sieve the rock sugar and then we will pack it. The red and black cherry sugar making process is very similar. For both these processes, we melt sugar and we use the rock sugar liquid that we get from the rock sugar making process and we mix it together. And then for the red jaggery sugar, you know, we add a bit of colouring. For the black jaggery sugar, we actually add molasses. Molasses is derived from the sugar making process where they remove the white liquid and the black liquid. The white liquid will go on to become your sugar, and then the black liquid is your molasses. This molasses, we add it into our black jaggery sugar, giving it the taste, the, the fragrance, as well as the nutrition. After we make it into a saturated sugar liquid, we actually will cool it down. It becomes powder almost instantly. Uh,就是说,我们的公司现在已经要发展那个机器化了。这几年就是用机器化来工作了。就是说,慢慢就是全部要全自动。
For the rock sugar process, what we've done is to really identify the areas that we could automate. And one of the things that we did was um, in terms of crushing the rock sugar. I remember when I was young, my father would always say, when I didn't do well in school, don't worry, son, if you didn't do well, you can come to the factory and knock rock sugar. So that, that was the first thing that I automated. We still have quite a bit of things to automate. For example, the stirring and cooking process, as well as the filling of the pails. We are looking forward to automating that next. In recent years, we also have changed our packaging to biodegradable packaging, so that's a little bit more friendly to the environment. In terms of water management, we look at monitoring our water as well as uh, improving our water consumption in our own factories. We are also exploring solar energy, um, but that's another day. John has one water efficiency project in the pipeline. A local startup called Fluidlytics has come up with a technology that could be applied at his factory. Sustainability in our factory building. Uh, Fluidlytics actually happens to be my nephew's uh, startup. So, uh, apart from trying to support him, uh, I think there's a lot of value in trying to stay green to help our factory not only save uh, water. Uh, also be able to save, us save money, but also in the long run, uh, it's all about sustainability. One day I was just reading the news and I realised that um, by 2025, over two-thirds of the world's population will actually be living in a water-scarce area. So seeing these alarming statistics, I, I decided um, to come up with a technologies to help um, consumers reduce their water consumption and try to save the earth. What we installed for you previously was our wave valve, which I actually have it here with us today. Oh, okay. So as mentioned before, actually, um, our valve actually compresses the air inside the pipeline, mm. um, resulting in greater water efficiency um, and cost savings. Yeah, sure. So actually, apart from our valve, we have another technology. There's a water IoT system that can help you guys greatly reduce on your cost and also increase your water efficiency as well. Oh, OK. And I think with our water IoT system, we can actually predict when leaks will happen and also when such leaks do occur, we are able to send immediate warning signals to the operations manager. To prevent the... To prevent, yeah, to prevent the leak from happening and, right. or actually um, solving the leak before it, the whole facility gets flooded. Mm, that, that, that's very important. I think having quick response time would actually help us uh, yeah. detect the problem quickly and then also quickly rectify it and then thus saving water. Yeah, I think that, that's a great feature, especially our building is so large. To ensure responsible water consumption within their company, John has asked Fluidlytics to install their latest water IoT system in the factory. So actually right now, I'm aware you guys are... Um, the readings are taken manually every month for both electricity and water. So actually, with our IoT technology, mm. we are able to do this remotely and also send the invoices out remotely oh. um, for accounting purposes. Knowledge is power. The more data John has about water usage across various processes, the more he's able to come up with a strategy to conserve water. Together with the new water valve technology in place, Cheng Yu Heng's water consumption could be reduced by up to 9% achieving cost savings of up to 30% every month. I think for Cheng Yu Heng, uh, water sustainability is very important because we use quite a lot of water for our own manufacturing processes. By being able to track the water consumption and also looking at how do we improve it, how do we prevent leaks, I think that goes a long way in terms of water sustainability. So within our own business, it's quite limited to what the sugar business can do. The next big thing for us, uh, it's one where we can actually tap on the startups, help startups to create a bigger impact on sustainability.
Good evening again. What causes this ill health? One big reason is diabetes. And unfortunately here, compared to other developed countries, Singapore is almost world champion. Just behind the US. Overall, one in nine Singaporeans have diabetes. But the prevalence in With the war against age. sugar, I think everyone's a bit more concerned on their daily intake. That being said, I think it's all about education, about moderation and an active lifestyle. Cheng Yuheng is our manufacturing business. So when it comes to innovation, we are quite limited, even in terms of innovation or sustainability. Innovate360 is a vehicle for us to help startups to go to market, scale, to invest in a wide variety of food businesses. But it leverages on Chen Yuheng's strengths. John Cheng advances sustainability through another avenue as a food accelerator. He set up Innovate360 with that very objective in mind. It was a way for me to pay it forward since I've been helped by a lot of partners, institutions during my time in the traditional business. For example, we work with uh, Whole Foods, a reformulation startup that helps companies create healthier products but taste the same. So we, with them, we are making healthier sugar. We had the intention of using food as a preventive approach to health. We want it to be such that you use food to prevent or delay the onset of diseases. John came to us with the intention of having a healthier sugar in his portfolio. Now, uh, it may seem a bit ironic that a sugar guy is looking for healthier sugar, but we see that as John taking a hedge on the whole sugar industry now because the government is making a lot of um, moves towards a healthier lifestyle with less sugar intake. So do you have any ideas on how to assess the kind of textural differences that uh, we have come up with two different directions? One way is to lower the glycemic index of sugar, which means that by it taking in this particular sugar prototype, your blood glucose does not spike up so rapidly. The other approach is to make something that is not even sugar. It will have lower calories. And in addition to that, right, both of these prototypes must be able to fulfill the functionalities of sugar. Okay, so today we've prepared quite a few prototypes for you. Uh, firstly, we've made your brown sugar into a low GI brown sugar. Mm -hmm. and it makes your brown sugar instantly a lot healthier. Mm. Yeah, and over here we have white sugar, the typical caster sugar. Now, here we have a whole foods sugar substitute which looks exactly like white sugar as well. Mm -hmm. But amazingly, it has zero sugar inside, but it performs exactly the same as sugar. We are looking at a unique composition of different sugar substitutes put together in a novel way that fulfills the functionalities of sugar. I actually got to try the different types of sugar and uh, be able to see that there's not much difference uh, to how normal sugar and this substitute sugar is. Oh. Uh, actually, it tastes uh, very much the same. Yes, indeed. And that's an important point for us because if it mm. tastes very different, it will, the consumers may not necessarily accept it as well. Mm. So this okay. is a control cake with normal sugar. It's just a very basic pound cake recipe. Mm. Oh, I should get the recipe from your guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. So on the right-hand side, you have your sugar substitute cake. So this cake has no sugar added in it at all. And on top of that, it is low GI. So this would really open the market for a lot of people who are suffering from diabetes. They will be able to enjoy their foods like they can before. So actually, how is the cake? Actually, it tastes like it's from the same cake, actually. That's I might be biased, but the sugar actually tastes the same as the one that was created by Whole Foods. What I really liked about it was that it had the same kind of texture, mouthfeel, and there wasn't an aftertaste compared to the other kinds of sugar substitutes in the market, uh, which either has a metallic taste or you can actually tell the difference. So in terms of taste, this was great. 
Using whole foods technology, we won't really need to change much of our sugar making process. It's just simply using uh, their ingredient and adding it into our current process. So we hope that because of this, uh, it'll be easy for a lot of the manufacturers to switch to this kind of alternative sugar. John founded Innovate360 in 2018, 10 years after he took over the helm of his family's business. It now helps more than 50 startups, all leveraging from the expertise, experience, and networks gained from his sugar business. For me, it's all about collaborations. It's all about working with partners, leveraging on other people's strengths. It's a different way of doing business from doing business in the past. In our company, we have actually innovated a novel technology using food waste, and we revalorized the food waste into a powerful antimicrobial compound. So this is how we turn them into a powerful antimicrobial compound. We take food waste, and mm -hmm. we have first cashew nut waste. I see. Oh, and, and you have uh, palm shell as well as crab. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, you, just, you just had lunch. <laughs> <laughs> no, this... These prawn shells and crab shells are actually um, what we use to make the disinfectants stay coats on the surfaces. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this is the first step of the process where we combine them together into a mixture and mm -hmm. synthesize it into a powder. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, and, and the orange liquid? The orange liquid is our proprietary solution that we use to synthesize uh, our ingredients together, oh, the food waste ingredients okay. that we have. So this process will take 24 hours and after that it will form a thickened mixture, like a paste. Mm. So after 24 hours, mm -hmm. um, this is how what it forms. It forms the, a paste-like structure right. and with this paste, we will put them into the oven to dry. So the whole process will take about 24 hours mm -hmm. and it will have it spin and filter it later after 24 hours and with a filtration process which is inbuilt in this bioreactor we will get um, Cytoplast solutions. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay, so, so this is the self sanitizing solutions. Oh, it's your liquid gold. Uh. Yes, <laughs> it is. So today what we will do is we'll spray coat and show you the effects before. The sanitizer is sprayed onto a surface to form a clear and continuously active disinfecting coat. The coat is effective for seven days and works against all bacteria and viruses, including the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Cytoplast is actually made from all food waste, right? Mm -hmm. So it's 100% edible ingredients in there. Oh, wow. So it's uh, safe to put, actually even spray them on fresh fruits. R really? Yeah, I'll, I'll do a demonstration. Okay, okay you're going to eat it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to eat it in front of you. So it actually is possible to eat it. Oh, wow. So maybe I can even consider this for my machinery as well? Yeah. We have implemented the C2 Plus antimicrobial solutions on all their high touch points areas in Innovate 360s, such as the lifts, as well as all their food manufacturing areas. After going through the process, I managed to see how they turn food waste into something useful, like the microbial coating. And for us, uh, I think it's, it's very good that we can actually uh, use that for our packaging as well as our machinery. John's food technology startups are set to disrupt the food industry, including John's own sugar business. Meanwhile, back at work in that very business, John's water-saving project bears fruit. So I think the purpose of this meeting today is to really go through the results from our installation a few months prior to this. Mm. Um, and also show you um, the effectiveness of our technology. Okay. So as you can see, there's about a 25% reduction in our water bills. Oh, so that's 25% savings in terms of water yes. that I save because of the valve? Yes. Oh, wow. So actually, before your average was about 1,200 cubic meters, and after you actually install our technology, I mean, it's dropped to around 904 cubic meters uh, a month. After looking at the results, definitely the technology is validated. We managed to save quite a bit of money. Firstly, in terms of uh, water consumption, it was reduced by 25%. And then, of course, in terms of manpower costs as well, uh, that was an additional bonus for us because we were initially looking at water sustainability as the main focus. 
But in, on top of that, you know, we also got manpower savings, which is an excellent uh, start. Oh, I see you have... Uh, yeah, they made the pace. Startups are the future for Singapore. I think it's where they are so disruptive, they are so innovative, and we're so glad to be part of their journey as well. All our 50 startups are in sustainability, and I think Innovic360 was also kind of set up in a way that wasn't just about us trying to just pay it forward, but also try to create that opportunity to do more in terms of sustainability. Okay, see you. Hey, Jess. Jess, you're Hey, Jess. Jess, yes. What are we having to eat? How's the cheese, then? Let me try a bit. Is it nice? Yeah, of course. This is one of our startups. Uh, they make the, the plant based cheese using uh, cashew nuts. I'm fine. It's good. Mmm. As director of Innovate 360, John assesses the viability of new food products created by his partner startups. His family, all of them foodies, are always prepared to offer feedback. Hello. Yeah. Very spicy. Yeah, it's, it's concentrated. When John was young, he was not as slim as now. No? He was fat. Right? He loves food. He eats a lot of food. So I, I know that he's a lover of food. So I believe that now he's so fit and slim because he's uh, very healthy conscious and um, he knows what he's going for, basically. So crunchy, huh? but we a bit soggy, right? Okay, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Well, huh? Nobody was bothered about food sustainability. Everybody thinks that food is going to be enough for the next century. Only of late, in 2015, 2016, then John started to welcome new ideas about uh, food sensibility, about new ideas of producing food. I'm actually preparing for a speech that I'm giving at Safra. It's a virtual event to talk about food sustainability, how we transform our business from a very traditional manufacturer to uh, accelerator, and then how we actually impact uh, the world through our sustainability. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm John Cheng. I'm the third generation. To give back, uh, but also create a bigger impact on sustainability, we launched Innovate360 and Feed9 Billion. Feed9 Billion started in 2018 with Thermastic Poly, Innovate360, Focus Tech Ventures, as well as SIM. So we started this open ecosystem platform really to try to feed 9.8 billion people. UN predicts that by 2050, there will be not enough resources to feed so many people. So at least 5.5 billion people would actually come from Asia. In 2019, we actually launched our Good Food Startup Menu to help entrepreneurs navigate through the food landscape and try to help them improve their businesses. So programs that we work together with Feed 9 Billion to actually help startups to improve their capabilities. We have workshops on sustainability, on how to calculate their carbon footprint, to uh, your branding, marketing, uh, tax incentives, and so and so forth. We're excited to be collaborating with uh, CPLC on uh, this, this carbon pricing workshop. I think a lot of the startups, they are unable to calculate the carbon footprint of uh, what, what they're doing, even though they are so much in sustainability. So I think this gives a very good baseline for them to be able to calculate that. So, so it's, uh, it's it is particularly important that we organize these workshops for these startups so that they will have a better idea how to calculate their carbon footprint um, so that they know whether they are really sustainable. 
Virtual conferences are the norm during the pandemic. But recently, the city eased safe management measures for meetings and events. John wants one upcoming workshop with the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition to be a physical one. He's chosen Innovate 360's headquarters as the venue. You guys haven't actually visited before, so I think it might be useful to have a recce plan. And then uh, we're looking forward to seeing you probably next week. Uh, likewise, looking forward to seeing you. All right. All right. Bye, thank you. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you. Bye-bye. Welcome to Innovate 360. Yeah, finally in person. Yeah. Yeah, so this is our auditorium. Generally, I think the recce went well. I think we identified the two spaces that we will actually do the workshop in the auditorium as well as the conference room. Because of SMM measures, we really need to keep our participants safe as well as ensure there's adequate measures. There's a projector here, screen is here also. So basically, best you can get two uh, from your side to actually be here lah, to take any live questions if you may have. Yeah, so so we'll, we'll fit as many as we can with the one meter distancing on this table and then the rest of them will be sitting at the back. Mm, yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Mm. That sounds good. My grandfather never started the business making rock sugar. He started with the idea of making Chinese candies, but then we pivoted to making rock sugar. Now we've gone full circle. We still produce our rock sugar, but we also make jewels rock sugar sticks. Mm. And now we have a food accelerator that helps startups. The business will continue to evolve. We will continue to grow. Uh, and that's our responsibility to bring the legacy forward for the next generation. John's addition to the family legacy are Jules, a line of rock sugar sticks. John launched Jules eight years after he took over the family business. It was a way to let the younger generation know that you can use rock sugar in your everyday life as a rock sugar candy, as a stirrer, but you can dip and stir. But what we really wanted to do um, was to keep the heritage and the culture that we had with our products. As discussed previously, we're trying a new colour. Oh, so we a... try to develop a newer colour for the jewel side. Oh, okay, okay. This is for the new series that we're going to launch next year. Yeah. So you told me that you want a more vibrant colour. So I try to go for a shiny colour as well. So I'm planning to like shine the yellow a bit with the gold dust. Yeah. So it's oh, very, very, very... Well, I see. Ah, the solution. Okay, this is a yellow shine. Oh. So it wow. enhanced the yellow colour that That's we have. That's so pretty, yeah. Then I show you uh, what actually we have done with the rock sugar. Okay. So we actually look through the how rock sugar crystallizes to make a much more functional uh, rock sugar rather than just a, a traditional rock sugar. For the jewels rock sugar sticks, we do quite frequent R and D. Typically, my team will look at the different kinds of flavours and colours out there in the market and try to apply it to the crystallisation process. We come up with different flavours really based on the trends today. So we are always constantly looking out for what the newest flavours in the market. Jewels is very special to me because that's in a way how I started my whole journey finding my passion in the business. And that's kind of advice I give to the next generation entering the business. That, you know, whatever you do, no matter how boring the business may seem, just find your passion in it and you will actually do something uh, greater. So we'll have some sitting there. John's carbon management yeah. workshop is a go-ahead and it's just a day away. John and his team have barely enough time for final checks. I think it's like between tables need to be one metre. We're just worried about some of the safe management measures, but of course, uh, we're going to make sure that there's uh, ART being done. Testing, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, you're even more muffled now. Okay, I'm coming over. Thanks, 
It's the day of the carbon management workshop. John has organized the event for the benefit of startups in Singapore's growing food tech sector. Among the participants are groups from his own food accelerator, Innovate 360. I uh, want to thank uh, CPLC for doing this workshop together with uh, Innovate 360. Uh, so this event is also supported uh, by Feed 9 Billion. Uh, and I hope from this workshop you'll be able to apply what you learn here to calculate your carbon footprint for your businesses so that you'll be able to monitor as well as to try to reduce it as well. Today's workshop is part of a national initiative, uh, the Low Carbon SG Programme. Uh, during today's workshop, participants will learn how to record, monitor and reduce their emissions. We will of course talk to them more broadly about uh, decarbonisation as a whole. Uh, but essentially it's for them to learn about emissions in their operations and how to reduce it. The tool, or the, the Carbon Emissions Recording Tool, or CERT for short, is designed with startups and SMEs in mind. It's a simple tool. It's meant for them, designed for them, it's versatile and robust. All they need to do is to input their operational data. All businesses, large and small, play a part in designing a future for all of us. Startups in particular, if you start right and continue designing your business model correctly, you will be positioning yourself for the future to be resilient and climate-proof, your, your business. So one of the ideas that they offered was uh, to plant trees to offset our carbon uh, footprint. And that's one of the things that I'm going to tap into. And the other thing is actually working out the numbers and figure out exactly what is my carbon footprint as a business. Well, today's workshop was very fun, enlightening and enriching and extremely useful. As a company that's uh, innovating in a space of food tech, which is there to replace conventional meat to provide you the alternative that's more sustainable, it's very essential for us to be able to measure our carbon emission because if we do not have the data with us, we won't be able to convince people adequately as to why they should be adopting our solutions instead of consuming conventional meat. So something that's extremely essential to a company that's so focused on sustainability and values it so deeply. We will definitely look at having more of these kind of workshops in future to actually educate the wider public as well as corporates, SMEs, as well as institutions, not just startups. Because I think that's the very crucial point where we can get the whole ecosystem to be more sustainable. Uh, the building is called Innovate 360 because we want to showcase the innovation throughout our businesses, 360 degrees. John wants to get his message about sustainable food across to more audiences. He's also asked often to share his own story of how a 74-year-old family business remains sustainable. Today, John meets quite a different group from a school nearby. Anyone heard of cell-based cell -based meat? Oh? <laughs> oh, okay, maybe give you a chance. Let me... Okay. Because it's cultivated in the lab, right? Yes, it's cultivated in the lab. We open up our factories for schools, for tours, for the public. We dry our rock sugar in the sun. So every time when it rains, the people from the office have to run out to help pull the trays back in. But the other thing is really to help us preserve our heritage, our cultural heritage, because that's something that a company like ours would be able to showcase and this is really about sustainability as well. You know one bucket when you put the liquid, you know how heavy is it? Anyone want to guess? 15? No, 50 kg. Wow, wow. The current generation managing Cheng Yu Heng is continuing the legacy that has been set forth by their grandfather and they are changing the direction of the company to make it more sustainable. They have a story to tell. And what's better than to let the children hear the story from the owners themselves? So the brown sugar used in a lot of your traditional uh, kueh or even uh, for your uh, fakau, your fakwe. Rock sugar is such a common item, but nobody really pays much attention to it. And the process of making rock sugar is actually quite tedious. Mm -hmm. 
after the tour, the children will be doing a comic book using their creativity based on their own interpretation and understanding of what they have seen and heard. Once the books are printed, we'll be distributing the books to our own school children during Children's Day and we'll also be sending copies of the books to our partner schools overseas for them to share with their children on our Singapore's heritage. Come this way. So this is our outdoor space. When Mrs Ong from Singan Primary approached me, she mentioned that there would be some sort of writing and a study trip. So I, I didn't think too much about it. So I hope you, you enjoyed the tour. You got to see our traditional business as well as our, our new business. Then after a couple of months, they came out with a draft version of the book and I was so impressed because I uh, didn't expect them to come out with an actual uh, a book that could capture uh, their imaginations and a little bit of our traditions in there. Here at uh, Singan Parmi, uh, it's the 90th anniversary and uh, also the book launch. It also happens to be Children's Day, so I got some uh, Kubo Shock Sugar Sticks. Um, yeah, we're going to give the, the kids. Where can I uh, uh, put this? Come, let me show you the way. Okay, can. I'm packing this as a gift uh, for the VIPs and teachers. Um, so it's something, a little something that we thought uh, we'll give out today uh, as part of the celebrations. After the ceremonies, John receives his personal copy of the school's comic book. It's part of a compendium of stories depicting the cultural and industrial heritage of Jurong, the town where John's factory resides. They depicted it in their own way, uh, which was very, very cute and uh, very different from how we as adults would look at, at things today. So um, I lo love the imagination, the creativity, and uh, even the illustrations were very well done. It really didn't seem like it was a comic book by children, but definitely a comic book for children. Yeah. Uh, I think a small one can put here, because it's got lighting. Yeah. Uh, no, I will Part of Innovate 360's plan is also to not only expand our footprints in Singapore, but also overseas. And one of the countries that we're looking at is Malaysia. So um, we're having an upcoming event that focuses on the Malaysia and Singapore uh, innovation ecosystem. So we're doing kind of like a demo day uh, where we showcase startups here as well as in Malaysia. The event is called Crossing the Causeway. It's John's first steps into taking his food accelerator across borders. What we want to achieve today is really to help startups to expand beyond just Singapore because of the market size and you know I think there's opportunities to grow their businesses in Malaysia, especially tapping on the manufacturers and the different resources that are available there. Our vision is to be really, really focused on sustainability. There are already three unicorns. Today, we work with various key partners and stakeholders to help more than. The Crossing the Causeway event was very successful. We had a lot of representation from both Malaysia and Singapore side. It was well received, and so we actually want to do more for next year. So, we're already starting to plan our next range of activities, which involves uh, helping startups to commercialize in Malaysia. John Cheng never wanted to be in a traditional sugar-making business. Today, he runs that business. And while he sustains its storied legacy, he's also grown that business to encompass innovations in the way food is consumed 
and produced. Mm, it's not as sour and gassy as... From being an uh, anchor for startups in sustainable food production to advocating for positive change in a variety of platforms, John Cheng has hit the sweet spot in business by showing that sustainability indeed makes good business sense. As cliche as it may sound, you know, the only constant is change. But I think we will just continue to evolve and to grow our businesses. What's next for me is really to develop an NRH 360 ecosystem, hopefully in Singapore as well as around the world. Sustainability is a way of life. It's not a concept. I believe very strongly that everybody can contribute and impact the world.